Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Court Rights Service for Sunday, September the 13th. It is my joy to welcome you here. My name is Allison Pinches, and I'm one of the pastoral staff here at Court Wright. And we just want to say a warm welcome to you from wherever you are joining us this morning. We're so glad that you are with us, and it is good to be together in this way. We wanted to take a moment this morning to talk a little bit more about how we're going to be together uh, in this fall, in this sort of new season. And um, we're all in the midst of changes and transitions, and that's true for us here at the church. So we want to let you know a little bit about sort of how we're proceeding. Um, we recognize that due to our limitations at the moment, we're not able to experience uh, worship and being together and physically uh, and all of the sort of experiences that many of us are accustomed to with gathering for church on Sundays. And so we are trying to consider the sort of um, various needs that we have as a community and ways that we long for people to be engaged and connected with one another. And that's led us to offer uh, sort of a hybrid model. So we're going to offer kind of two streams um, for you to be connected and engaged with one another in worship on Sundays this fall. And again, that's just trying to address the various ways that we want to be connected with one another and knowing that at this time, we can't sort of do that in all the ways we want in one model. So our hybrid model is going to include, as we mentioned last week, uh, these new sort of uh, online watch parties with your neighborhood group, as well as uh, opening up the doors starting October 4th for a limited number of people to be able to join for in-person worship in the building. And some of the hope, like, like I said, for our neighborhood groups gathering in this way is that you'll be able to have some more time for conversation and connection and checking in with one another, spending some time praying for one another. You'll do that by joining in on a call, a video call, uh, having a little bit of introduction and time with one another, and then having a time of listening, watching the service together, and then being able to pray for one another and check in a little bit following the service time together. So you'll hear more about that from your neighborhood group leaders in the coming weeks. Uh, once again, if you have not heard from your leaders or are wanting more information, you can reach out to me at any time, allison at courtwrightchurch.org. Um, and if you have not previously been involved in a neighborhood group, uh, please speak to me as well, because I would love to get you connected to what's happening. And we're really excited about the opportunity uh, that these groups on Sunday mornings can have, like I said, to connect, engage with one another. Uh, it's like getting to see your friends. <laughs> you are getting to see your friends. It's not just like that on a Sunday morning. Um, so that's kind of one stream. The other stream, like we said, is we know that for a number of people, um, it's really important to be able to be back in this building and to be uh, in person and face to face. And so we are working ahead towards being able to open that up for a number of people uh, starting on October the 4th um, with uh, the protocols that we need in place to keep one another safe. Uh, so again, we just wanted to sort of outline a little bit. We'll keep keep sharing about that because we realize it is kind of different, but we look forward to being together as one body, uh, even though we are doing that in these sort of two different venues and with these two different streams. So if you have any questions about that, you can contact any of the staff, but feel free to be in touch with me, uh, Allison at courtrightchurch.org, specifically if it's related to uh, the neighborhood groups and joining in with a community to be at church together, um, to be at part of our worship church together on Sunday mornings. Um, so like I said, that's going to be rolling out in the next couple of weeks, and uh, you should hear more information, but feel free to be in touch with me if you have any questions. Once again, just a reminder that there's lots going on for our children and youth, and Rowena has all the details for that, and you can be in touch with her, Rowena at courtrightchurch.org, and she would love to get your family um, and your children of all ages uh, connected to the community and to what's happening for our kids and youth, so please feel free to speak with her. Okay, I think that's it for announcements for the moment. We're going to uh, enter into our time of worship with one another, uh, and we're going to hear these words from Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore, we are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. 
In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Let's continue in worship this morning. Hey, good morning, Courtright. It is so good to be with you. My name is Justin Sitzma, and I'm here joined with Brian Watson and Lynn and Glenn Fletcher. We are getting ready to start live streaming, which is really, really exciting, which means that we can have a little bit more instrumentation in our uh, in our services, which we're very, very excited about. So I, I hope wherever you are that you'll join me as we sing this amazingly powerful song, The Lion and the Lamb.
one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by that we would have union with you, that we would have unity with you and with one another. But Lord, there are so many times where we struggle with that, where we struggle with keeping that unity with you and with others, where we struggle to love others, our neighbors, our family, our friends, people that are different than us. We struggle to love them as you would have us love them, and we struggle to love you in the midst of that as well. God, give us the strength by your Spirit as we confess this to you, as we bring this before you. Would we stand in your truth, in your love, in your grace, in your victory? Would we know that we can do better by your Spirit this week, not on our own strength, but by your strength alone. And we pray this now in your name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Alex. I'm the lead pastor here at Courtright. And this morning, we are diving back into the book of Ephesians. We spent the summer with a variety of guest preachers in the Psalms, 
and that was really great. Um, last Sunday, Andrew Douglas and the Sunday before, Ken Oak, both of them really spoke to me personally. Ken in particular helped me with something I was fretting about. And I hope that was true for you too, that, that uh, out of the Psalms, you received God's encouragement through our guest speakers. Today, we're picking up from Ephesians where we left off before the summer started. We got halfway through the letter, so it was the perfect time to take a break. Um, but now we are beginning at the start of the second half of Ephesians, if the chapter the chapter we're looking at today is chapter four. So in part one, Paul gave us these incredible building blocks of Christian identity, of, of doctrine, telling us who we are. He answered this question, who are we as followers of Christ? Now, starting in chapter four, he's going to get into the practicalities of what that looks like. How are we supposed to live? What's distinctive about the Christian life? We heard a lot in the first half of the letter about how we're God's holy people set apart for his special purposes. Now, Paul's going to show us what that looks like. And so chapters four to six of this letter major on how the church is called to be different, kind of like a new society, as we live out our calling to be in Christ. And we're going to spend the next six weeks exploring that theme. So let's pray together before we open our Bibles. Holy Spirit, would you come and build us up through your word this morning? We ask you to tear down the stuff that won't last, that's not pleasing to you, and we ask you to put us back on the foundation of your Son, Jesus Christ. Would you shape us more and more as individuals and as a congregation so that we resemble him? Amen. So if you haven't got a Bible with you, um, this is the time to maybe grab one. Um, if you've uh, either got a hard copy of the Bible or have it on a screen, that'll help you because I'll be referring back to verses throughout the sermon. So we're going to read Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16. Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord then, and he was a prisoner, he was under house arrest, likely in Rome, he was in Roman custody. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, and this is a quote from Psalm 68, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my kids are growing up. You may not have seen them in a while because we haven't gathered on Sunday morning in a long time, six months to be precise. But this year, this September, last week, in fact, Chloe started her first year at Conestoga College, and she's doing that online, of course. Callum is leaving for Bible College in British Columbia on Thetis Island this coming Friday, and Lily is now basically an old pro at high school as she enters grade 10. We've only got one kid left in high school, which is pretty crazy, and 
It's been a little emotional for me over the past couple of weeks as I've reflected on that, as the reality of that has kind of hit us, it's come home. All of us remember the moments we had as kids, as teenagers, as young adults, graduating from grade school or from high school, getting our driver's license, leaving home and having our own place for the first time, even if it was just a room in residence. We remember our first job and our first paycheck. As we grow up, we go through changes, and some of them can be predictable. For example, most people finish high school when they're around the age of 17 or 18. But we also grow up, I think, in ways that are less obvious. For example, uh, as Christians, we grow generally in our relationship with God. We, we hopefully do that. We also grow in wisdom. We grow in knowledge of the Bible. We grow in service, in understanding how God is calling us to be part of his church and to, to serve others. And you can't see that as easily from a distance as those things uh, you might write in a Christmas letter telling your friends what's going on with your family that year. Paul wants us to grow and to flourish in the Christian life, but that growth is not guaranteed. He wants us to grow because our purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's a picture of harmony. It's a picture of peace, of flourishing, and that is what God intends for us. And we, all of us want that, I think. We want that blessing. Paul knows we need it, and so as he moves into the second part of his letter, he wants us to live out our true identity in Christ. So three things here that we're going to reflect on this morning. First of all, who are we? And that's going to be the life of the Trinity as God pours himself into us. We'll see that in the early part of this passage we read. Secondly, what does that look like, that identity as it's lived out? Well, it looks like maturity and unity. And thirdly, how do we get there? Like, what are the next steps? Well, Paul says we speak the truth in love. So we have the life of the Trinity within us. That's who we are. We are growing into maturity. That's what that looks like. And we speak the truth in love to one another within community. That's how we get there. So the first thing is that Paul urges us to live a life worthy of our calling. And he wrote about that calling in, in the first three chapters of this letter. So now he gets into behavior. He says, be humble and gentle be patient, bear with one another, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And that is a short section of this passage, but wow, that is a lot to live up to. And I think maybe Paul gets that because it's almost like he pauses in verse 4 and gives us another identity check. He gives us a foundation on which those behaviors can happen with seven promises or statements that talk about the oneness that we have as Christians and who we are in Christ. So what makes you a Christian is not just that you're a nice person or that you are a humble person or a gentle person or a moral person or that you believe in the Bible. What makes you a Christian is that you have the life of God in you. So we should never think of Christianity as mainly a way of life. It's, it's not just about being nice and kind and caring for people. Of course, it's all that, but the true essence of it is so much bigger, bigger than simply being nice. You're not nice as a Christian. You're new. Becoming a Christian means that you have been made completely new. You're alive, and you have the life of the Trinity within you. Paul told us back in chapter 2 that God made us alive in Christ and raised us up and seated us in the heavenly places. And now he's elaborating on that. Later in this passage, we read that Christ is the head and we are the body. So the head and the body, Christ and us, share the same life. And verse 4 here at the beginning says, we share the same one spirit, one Lord, and one God and Father over all. And that life Father, Holy Spirit, and Son within us is the life of the Trinity. And God's pouring that into us. You see, this great power has come into your life and you've woken up to God. You're seated in the heavenly places. That's who you really are now. You're raised up. It's this huge thing. Next, we see what that looks like more practically. 
And it's a picture of unity that comes through Christ by his grace. So here there's a quote from Psalm 68 and, and Jesus is compared to a conquering king, a king who takes captives and who is generous in victory. So Christ ascends out of the triumph of the resurrection and then he descends to defeat death and evil and then he fills the whole universe. It's this vision that focuses us on Jesus. And all of this points to his power, his ability to save us and also to give us his gifts. And so God gives every, Christ, every Christian a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts so that we can serve and encourage each other. And we get five that are identified here. The apostles went out with the good news. We read about that in the New Testament. And so the apostolic gifting, the first one mentioned here, equips you to start new things, to plant churches, to plant gardens, to initiate ministry and service. The prophetic gifting enables us to speak God's truth in a special way. The evangelistic gift helps people to believe in God, helps you to come alongside people and to uh, invite them and present the gospel to them persuasively. Teaching gifts help people to learn and understand truth uh, once they have become a Christian. Pastoring or shepherding gifts help individuals and communities to grow together. So this is not a complete list, and we shouldn't get too fixated on these categories, you know, making more out of them than Paul intends. When Judith, my wife, was a teenager, she did a spiritual test, a spiritual gifts test uh, with her youth group in Toronto. And it turned out that she had the spiritual gift of martyrdom. Now, I don't think her parents were thrilled with that result, and really that may not be the way to grow your youth group. But an illustration of how sometimes our when we get too interested in spiritual gifts, we can lose sight of what really matters. What we absolutely do need to pursue spiritual gifts, but most of all, I think we need to grasp verse 11, where it says that leaders in the church are equippers, people who know how to equip the rest of the church for service. In other words, every Christian has a gift, and the leaders equip the people to do ministry uh, with each other and from the base that is the church. About a year ago here at Courtright, we started a new Christian formation program called Equip, and actually we got the name for it right out of Ephesians 4, this passage we've read. And some of you might remember we had a class on the Old Testament, we had a class on uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, amazing book, Mere Christianity, and another um, class that met on ways that we can pray, different varieties of prayer. Well, the pandemic interrupted all of those plans, which we saw continuing. And, and yet, even though that was a setback, I think the pandemic has also forced us to get more serious about this calling to equip, because sometimes leaders are tempted to do it all. Sometimes staff are tempted in that way, elders are tempted in that way, and, and maybe something you can do to speak truth and love to me or to others in leadership at the church is to say, hey, remember, you are called to equip. And so sometimes we're in danger of thinking about everything happening centrally. I mean, that, that's a good thing. It's a unity, right? Sunday morning is about unity and coming together, and we want to pull everyone together like that. But I think the pandemic has challenged us to think more in terms of equipping. Like, how can we not be focused on this stage where I am right now and everyone looking at me or whoever is up front, but how can we use all the gifts to serve each other and to build up the body? And we've, one of the ways we've done that is through neighborhood groups, and Allison talked a little bit about that at the beginning of the service. We're kind of shifting in our focus with neighborhood groups, and I hope you will be part of a neighborhood group this fall because we're, uh, as a session and as a staff team and as the leadership of the church, we are trying to listen to the Holy Spirit, who I think is waking us up to certain um, blind spots we may have, have, may have had and, and focusing ba us back on who we are as Christians and as the body of Christ. Because we want to have this full body experience. We don't want it to just be about a few people. 
And I, and I know the Holy Spirit has great things in store for us as we grow in maturity as a congregation that way. And we'll be talking more about that this fall. So that's the purpose here of all these gifts. In verse 12 and 13, it says that they're meant to prepare God's people for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity and maturity. So it's all about growing up spiritually. But if that's the case, it means that we're all immature or that wouldn't be the, the focus, the, the purpose of these gifts and of the church. And so Paul puts it in kind of a negative way in verse 14. He says, then we will no longer be infants. We are spiritual babies. And the reason we need to be part of the church is that otherwise we will stay babies. And Paul, amazingly, Paul includes himself in that. He says, we will no longer be babies. And that means everyone, even the greatest of leaders like Paul are, are immature as well. And most of us are really immature. When God comes into your life, there's this enormous change. And what is the result? It creates a spiritual baby. Have you ever thought of it that way? But even as we consider that, we know it's not good to stay in that place. Babies are alive, and they're actually as alive as they're ever going to be, whether you're a baby or 20 years old or 50 years old or 80 years old, you're at the same level of aliveness. Babies also grow. They grow faster. They grow better than you do later on. The point is that when you become a Christian, you get a new life, and that's good. But to stay an infant isn't good. It's wrong. So Paul says it's really important to grow up. So what does it mean to be a spiritual baby? How do we, how do we recognize that? Well, First of all, it, it means that you're blown here and there, and, and every kind of teaching, every new trend that comes along, you kind of are prone to run with it. So if you're immature, you're not discerning. Think about real babies. Real babies, uh, you could put right in front of them good food, bad food, and poison, and they're not discriminating. They, they could choose just to eat all the poison up rather than the good food. They'll eat anything. You've got to keep the poison away from them. Those of you who are new parents out there, uh, take note of that. Paul says that's how spiritual babies are too. They can't tell good teaching from bad teaching. So unless you know your Bible, unless you've reflected deeply on who God is and his purposes, you're not yet mature. The next thing is we know that real babies are incredibly self-centered. And that's partly why we pray for those of you who have babies in your households, um, because it can be so all-consuming. Um, and spiritual babies are self-centered too. They're always thinking about themselves. You're always feeling slighted or offended. You're always conscious of how other people are treating you, if it's unfair. You're self-absorbed. You can't take criticism. You're concerned about your image and how you look. These are some of the marks of spiritual immaturity. The third thing about real babies that, that I want to mention today is that, that they are not steady. They go back and forth. They don't have um, much attention, much focus. The only way that you can get a baby to pay attention at times to you is with fireworks, is with lights, action. I have this thing I do with my finger Sometimes when I'm baptizing a baby and the baby is crying, I'll, I'll make this fun noise, uh, which sometimes I like to do on my own as well uh, because it is pretty fun. But that's the kind of thing that gets a baby's attention, right? And, and the next thing you know, they're bored and they're crying again. So spiritually, what does this mean? Well, if you worship and hear God's word and get convicted about something you need to address in your life and then you don't do anything about it, well, again, you're a spiritual baby. Or if you constantly, constantly are needing God to intervene, to show up, um, to answer your prayer in a dramatic way, you need fireworks. Well, that too is a kind of immaturity. So don't be looking for the spectacular in your walk with God. Don't always ask him, what have you done for me lately? Don't be demanding like a baby. So if I can put this more positively, maturity is that you know the Bible and you're wise. You're not always thinking of yourself. You're thinking of others. You're serving others. You're humble in that. You admit when you're wrong and you ask for forgiveness. You, you seek reconciliation that way. And you're steady. You follow through even when it easy, isn't easy. And Paul says that even he doesn't have all of these characteristics. So 
we shouldn't really be shocked when we see spiritual immaturity among Christians. Every church is filled with babies, and it's going to be messy. There's going to be food on the floor, on the walls. There are going to be dirty diapers. So why are we surprised when Christians act immaturely? Because we aren't saved by our maturity, right? We're saved by grace and by grace alone. When God comes into our lives, we're babies and we have a long way to go, every one of us. So don't be surprised by the mess. Don't be disillusioned by it. It is what God, in a way, it is what God is working with us through. It's, it's expected. But the next thing is, and, and this is really important, don't put up with spiritual immaturity in yourself. Be unsurprised and be patient when you see it in other people, but do not tolerate it in your own life. We all start as babies, but we do not want to stay there. If you've got things in your life, bad attitudes, bad habits, don't just say, don't say that's just the way I am. Don't say that's my personality. Because God accepts us for who we are, but he never leaves us that way. He's always drawing us into his change. We call that sanctification. And it's the life of God that you have in you, right? Remember that? It's the power of God coursing through you. And do you think your issues are any match for that? No, they are not. So how do we get there? How do we get to maturity? Well, we get there through community and by speaking the truth in love. There is no growth into maturity by yourself. It's only through the relationships in your church community that you're going to grow like this. The deeper and closer your relationships in the church, the more you will grow into the unity that comes with maturity. It means you can't just drop in on church once in a while and expect that you're going to grow. You can't keep your distance from other people if you want to see that happen in your life. You can't be in conflict with other people and avoiding them. None of these things can persist in your life if you want the growth that God wants to bless you with. So the basic principle is you need this tight and close community. But the basic practice is right here in verse 15. Speaking in the truth in love, that's it. And you will grow as you're part of a community that is seeking a balance between truth and love. You need both of them. Honesty or truth, you need that, but it can't be honesty that's separated from kindness and support. You need a mixture. You need this balance. Because without both of these things, without both love and truth, we're going to die spiritually. So first of all, love without truth is deadly. We can't know ourselves unless someone tells us who we are from outside. Over the past six months, I've seen a lot of myself on YouTube, a lot more than I ever wanted to. And I not- I've noticed that I do this weird thing with my hands, which, which I find quite annoying. And if you find it quite annoying, you don't need to email me about it because I'm already pretty annoyed about it myself. Something else that my wife, Judith, has drawn my attention to is that uh, I don't always look at the camera. Sometimes I look away from the camera over there because I'm alone in this room and maybe someone's going to come in. And wouldn't that be great if somebody came and joined me here because of my loneliness? I like to have people uh, with me and maybe at some point We'll trot out the laugh track again. Uh, But the last thing Judith said before I left the house this morning was remember to look in the camera because that's something that helps with communication. And so I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have my attention drawn to that if it wasn't for her, uh, an outside viewpoint, pointing it out to me. So if you're in a place where people love you, but they won't tell you the truth about yourself, you won't grow in self-knowledge and you will not become the person you need to be. But on the other hand, truth without love is deadly too. When people tell you the truth harshly or when they do it just without kindness, without empathy, you're not going to listen to them probably. Like They will drive you away with that approach. So truth without love does not accomplish truth, and love without truth does not accomplish love. We will die spiritually without truth and love together. Taylor Swift has a song on her new album, Folklore, 
that she wrote and sings with Bonnie Iver. It's called Exile, and it's really good. Partly, I, I love it because it, it gives us this compelling picture of love gone wrong. So Swift and Justin Vernon sing from a place of sadness uh, because they are breaking up. That, that's the story the song tells. But it's like they're singing past each other and, and the singing is layered in such a way that it creates that impression. They aren't hearing each other. They're missing each other. At one point he sings, you never gave a warning sign. And she answers, she sings, I gave so many signs. And, and I have to wonder if anyone spoke truth in love to them. And, and maybe that's part of what led to this exile happening. Now, whether it's your marriage or a close friendship, a situation in your family, God's design for us is not to be in exile. It's for us to be at home in community. And the community that he has in mind for us is the body of Christ. And in that community, we need others to speak truth in love to us for our health and for our growth. And the whole point of this letter, the whole point of the book of Ephesians, is to say that you don't need to be in exile from those you love or used to love. There is redemption in Christ as we grow and as we're formed in his image. If you read Ephesians 2, the second half of it, it says exactly that. It says we're no longer strangers or exile, and it's talking about Gentiles and Jews, these two ethnic groups coming together, but it applies to every division in our lives between the people we, we have lost friendships with in the broken relationships of our lives. If you're dealing with exile and brokenness in your life in relation to a friend or your spouse or within your family, I hope and pray that you have or will find a group of Christians to whom you can go with that, who can pray for you, who can speak truth in love to you. And if you don't, I really want to encourage you to ask God to lead you to that place. It's a homecoming, and you will never regret it. It's what we were created for. But let's be clear, even as we offer up that prayer, that no one can keep truth and love together perfectly, the way we need it kept together. Some of us are nice people who tend to love without truth. Some of us are direct people, and we tend to tell the truth without much love. So why is that? The reason we can't keep truth and love together as we need them to be together is because of our selfishness and our sin. So why do some of us love without truth? Because we're afraid the person we're speaking to will get angry at us if we tell them the truth or that the relationship will suffer and will feel guilty. But the real problem isn't that we care about the relationship. The real problem is our pride and our self-centeredness. We're thinking of ourselves. Now, I, I myself have had to struggle with this over the years big time. I am a conflict avoider, and it, it took me years to see how much damage that was doing uh, to relationships in my life, in, in my marriage, in my family, in the church community. And the way I've come through that is to have friends who can challenge me, who can speak the truth in love to me, and more formally with the help of mentors and with professional guidance. On the other hand, why do those of us who are truth-tellers struggle to love? Well, I think it's often because we, we want to be right. We like to win arguments. We like to get the last word. And so if you tell the truth without love, it's because you're not really about the truth, you're about yourself. And if you love without truth, you're still all about yourself. We cannot achieve the balance of truth and love that we need to grow and to live and to flourish. And it's all because of our self-centeredness and our sin. Now that, that might sound pretty depressing, but next we can ask simply, what's the solution? What does Paul have to say in response to this dilemma? Well, Paul points to the gospel of Jesus Christ as he always does. And he asks, why the cross? Why did Jesus have to die? Always in his writings, he's pointing there. And it's because of the truth. And the truth is that we are all sinners and we are lost. And unless someone pays the cost of our sin, we are lost eternally. On the other hand, there's also love. Jesus went to the cross because he loved us. Think about it. When Jesus goes to the cross, that's, that's really 
to start the worst possible news because it means that you are so lost, you are so messed up that nothing short of the death of the Son of God can save you. But, but as Jesus does that for us, he's also saying, I love you so much and you are so valuable to me that I'm willing to give up my life for you. I will do it freely. You have to see how lost you are without Jesus, that you are on your way to hell to grasp the hugeness of his love and mercy. But you also have to see how much he loves you, or you won't be able to accept the truth that you're lost. It will be too horrible for you. We need both. And the gospel is the ultimate message that combines truth and love. If you see what Jesus did for you, it will humble you so that you will never tell the truth without love again, as, as the, the presence of the Holy Spirit guides you and shapes you into that. It will give you a new security so that you will not have the same need to please people. And so I pray that you and all of us at Courtright will grow into speaking the truth in love and that we will become a community of people in Christ in which we are no longer infants and where the Spirit is nurturing our growth and flourishing and sending us out until we reach maturity and become more and more like Jesus. There is nothing more important than that in life. And we've got to make that happen among us within Courtright Church and you're invited to be part of that. The Holy Spirit this morning, I trust, is speaking to you and drawing your attention to ways that you can respond to God's word. God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three. Deep 
Would you join with me now in prayer? Father God, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that we can uh, enter freely before your throne of grace and with one another, uh, even as we are spread out in this way. Um, God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you for uh, the way that you are a God that continues to bring order and peace out of chaos. And God, we uh, bring before you uh, the needs and the things that are on our hearts this morning. We uh, think of our families and our kids and teachers in our midst who have all started back to school. And we pray again for your provision and for peace as we settle into uh, new ways of doing things and new routines. God, we think two of our university students who are getting ready or have just started into classes. And God, we ask for your um, help for them as they transition for many into a new model of learning and a new format. Uh, in particular, we think of the Christian groups on campus who are uh, seeking to connect with first-year students and care for you and uh, share your good news. We think of NISA with the University Christian Fellowship Group as they are trying to yeah, figure out how to connect virtually with first-year students and how to make those uh, relationships and connections. And we pray for your um, your blessing. We pray for um, connections to be fostered even in these unusual ways. And we think um, also of Power to Change and of Guelph Campus Ministries and of the, the other groups on campus, Lord, who are uh, seeking to share about you and to connect and care for their community. We pray for lots of creativity and boldness and courage and perseverance in these unusual times. God, we uh, Think of those in our congregation who may have lost work in this past week. God, we pray for your provision for them. We pray for your comfort for them. And I pray that you would hold them and guide them. Um, would you give them wisdom as they consider what options in the future are? And that may be people from the last week, but it may be the last month or last number of months. God, we ask for your um, help and protection uh, for those affected um, with losing work in this way. And God, we think, too, about the ongoing needs that just feel so many around our world. Um, and God, in particular, we're thinking of uh, refugees who have, um, there's just been such an incredible number of people who have had to flee their homes around the world um, at all times, but in these last number of years. And in particular, we're thinking of um, the island of Lesbos in Greece, with the large refugee camp that houses thousands of people and uh, the terrible, terrible fires that that camp suffered and the thousands of people, I think 13,000 people that had to be evacuated because of that. Um, God, we ask for your mercy and your provision. Um, it just feels hard to comprehend more suffering for people that have already suffered so much. And we pray for uh, relief. We pray for um, we thank you for spaces that have been opened up elsewhere in Europe, especially for the kids from these camps to be able to go. Um, but we ask for, for more and we pray for your, your mercy in that place. And we think too of one of our mission partners, Teach Beyond, and uh, the two workers that they have just recently sent before this fire started to try to help classes uh, start for children in that camp. And so we just pray your blessing on those Teach Beyond staff and pray again for for wisdom and creativity to figure out how to lead and care well um, amidst all of these 
uh, multiple crises. And we pray too for the work of Teach Beyond um, elsewhere, and we pray for some of the challenges they've, they've had recently with their computer and tech issues, uh, which are just so vital right now in terms of uh, communication, and pray for you to help uh, in smoothing those things out so that uh, that ministry is able to communicate effectively and well with one another and beyond. And God, we think too of uh, the wildfires that are raging in Northern California and Oregon on the West Coast. And God, we think of the many who have um, had to flee their homes and be evacuated and who are um, at risk of losing everything, even the, the families that have lost loved ones in the midst of this. And again, we pray for an end to those fires and pray for provision and protection for all who are involved. God, it feels like there, the needs are limitless. It just feels like uh, there is much chaos in our world these days. And again, we remember that you are a God that brought order out of chaos and that that is the good work that you continue to do. So we do pray for your peace and we pray that you would help us to know how to live faithfully in these times. God, would you help us to know um, how to act justly, how to love mercy and to walk humbly and faithfully with you. And we entrust ourselves and our community and all of our plans for how we're going to be a community in these coming weeks and months to you and to your care. And we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness and love. We praise you in your name, Jesus. Amen. After the service today, you're invited to meet with a prayer minister. If there's any need in your life, if you're going through something difficult and uh, you would like someone to pray with you, or if you want to give thanks to God for something that you're celebrating right now, uh, we encourage you and our prayer ministers would be eager to pray with you and for you. There's also, for those who aren't meeting in neighborhood groups after the service this morning, there's a virtual coffee hour. Uh, and so if you're, maybe you're new to Courtright, you've been visiting for a little while, or you're simply not connected to a group yet, uh, you can join in the coffee hour. And, and links, information for how to connect with both prayer ministries and the virtual coffee hour will be on the screen after the service. Friends, go in peace. May the love of God our Father, may the friendship and both the truth and love of his son Jesus, and may the guidance, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit be with you today in the week ahead and forevermore. God bless you. We'll see you next week.